Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for the uh, third part in our public safety webinar series. My name is Lisa Travers and I'm joining you from my basement office and um, hope everyone's having a great day and that your isolation has been going okay. I did a workout this morning and I used two cans of black beans as weights. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, we have uh, Dave Adams today to present our webinar um, on PCTEL and their testing solutions. I'll let him explain exactly everything that he's gonna talk about. Um, I just wanna tell you a few housekeeping notes. We are recording this. So after the webinar, I can't promise you exactly when, we will share a copy of the recording. Um, as well, we will share a PDF of the presentation and everyone will also get a certificate of attendance. So that, that will take us a bit longer, I think. It might go out automatically, we'll see, but um, if we can get that out, it'll definitely go out, just, just be a little bit patient. Um, the last thing is that we are taking questions throughout the webinar. If there's anything that I think is appropriate, I will uh, interrupt, but the majority of the questions will take, uh, we'll answer them at the end. So it makes sense to submit them when you think of them because they are, um, it's good, timing. Um, and with that, I'm just going to hand things over to my colleague, Charlie. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Charlie Schultz with Alliance. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our third in the third installment in our series of three on public safety wireless. We started two weeks ago doing an overview of some of the general requirements, what makes public safety unique. Uh, last week, Don Henry from Comma spoke on some RF design considerations. And throughout both the previous two weeks, we've talked a lot about the importance of testing, testing both before, during, and after the, the installation process, and on a recurring basis as well to ensure the system works. Uh, for that, I'd like to introduce Dave Adams, who's with our friend with PCTEL, uh, very well versed in some of the challenges of tests, as well as considerations to keep in mind and actual you know, how-to tips on having a good, uh, productive, thorough testing process. So, Dave, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Charlie. So, just wanna say uh, thanks to Alliance and Charlie uh, for welcoming us to this webinar. We're really pleased to be here and it's nice to be able to follow Don and his expertise. So, today in our, for our agenda, um, let me get my page down working. I'm going to spend a few minutes, maybe five or so at the beginning, kind of recapping some of the major points uh, made by Charlie and Don as it kind of lays the foundation for the uh, testing uh, details we'll cover. We'll spend most of our time talking about the specific approach uh, toward testing that is uh, addressed in the various codes. And at the end, I'll just uh, briefly mention our solution, which does implement this approach, a little bit of a case study about uh, the benefits of using that type of approach. Okay, so just um, just as a brief introduction, I just want to emphasize the fact that there really are uh, multiple types of networks with various technologies that come to play. The most common one, of course, that everybody thinks about when you, if you ask the question, what about emergency responders? They go into a building, they need to be able to talk uh, to be safe. So you're normally talking about a system that is owned and operated by the local jurisdiction, by the AHJs. And it's a primarily voice system. And really it's meant to, to make sure that first responders can safely communicate. And, and that's really important. And that's a lot of what we'll focus on today. But to really round out uh, having a safe environment uh, for emergency responses, there's also things like um, the broadband cellular networks that are supplied by the major uh, operators in the US, at and Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. Um, and really the role they play is oftentimes more and more first responders are relying on data applications, but even more importantly, people in a building in an emergency need to be able to make a 911 call and they need to be able to get um, notifications if there's an emergency. So that's very important when you ask 
is a building going to be safe? And lastly, many of the larger corporations uh, will actually have a third type of network um, that is involved for security staff. Uh, oftentimes when something goes wrong, their security people are the first responders, the first first responders that show up to help. So the radio networks that they use are also really important to make sure that they're working well in building. What is really uh, helpful in this whole topic is the fact that these networks all operate very similarly. So a lot of the same themes that we're going to talk about apply to all of them. How well does the coverage, how well can you talk and communicate? Uh, what are you going to do to fix them? How can you test them? All those kinds of things are really going to apply equally to all of these, even though our major focus is going to be on that one system uh, type of system that's used by the city and county. Um, okay. Uh, so clearly, as was highlighted in the last uh, two sessions, the, there's always this big problem with outdoor networks when they start to try to uh, send their signals into a building so people can communicate as they walk into a building. Problems happen. Um, and we talked all about what those kinds of problems are. Power gets lowered. Uh, signals start to bounce around. Multiple paths start to hit a radio device. All those things really contribute to a poor performance. So when you go to say, can I communicate safely in a building? Those are the things that would kind of undermine that. Um, and so we, we spent a lot of time in the first two sessions talking about the solution, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, public safety radio networks using P25 or older technologies. They're almost always going to use some kind of a bi-directional amplifier make sure that the signal works well to the radios in the building and to the radios going back out to the up, upper network. So that's kind of been well discussed. Um, and so really another big point that was brought out in the last few weeks is what motivates um, people to put a system in. And as was referred to in a commercial world, it's all about the money, it's all about can you talk well? Uh, are people want to occupy your building, rent your building, work in your building? And they're going to always ask, well, can I communicate over my cell phone? It's not the same with public safety. There's not as much um, financial motivation as it is. Uh, probably a more important motivation is can people uh, respond to emergencies safely? And that requires good communication. So what's happened to enforce that those problems are addressed with the codes. And as was talked about again the last two weeks, there's a, a wide variety of uh, things that play into, you know, a given building in a given city or county, you know, what does it mean for a radio system to work in that location? There's two national codes. They get adopted and adapted by the by all the local jurisdictions and you know, the fire marshals have a say in it and the radio departments have a say. And essentially, you know, when, you, when you're on the right and you're a building owner, or you're the people helping the building owners to understand performance and what you got to do to fix it and how well has it got to work at the end, it really comes down to making sure you understand, you know, what that local jurisdiction has adopted and is enforcing. Right. Okay, so this is kind of all background information so far. Um, it was kind of alluded to and some points were brought out. If you tried to summarize what these national codes uh, require and what shows up in some pretty close form in almost every city and county's local building codes or fire codes, they're gonna say something like this. You take a building for each floor, you're going to kind of divide it up into 20 grid areas. You're going to perform a test in each of those areas. If there is multiple networks involved, uh, one for the fire, one for the police. If there's you know, an older analog system and a newer P25 system, if you're in the county, the city, whatever it is, there may be multiples for each of those. You perform a test in each area and you grade it automatically. You're going to say, this is considered a passing grade for that measurement, or it's not. And then the frequency, that channel is going to pass or fail in that area. 
And then as you go through the floor uh, and you go through the building, multiple floors, at the end, you're going to kind of count up a percentage and say, does a certain percent of the test uh, have a passing grade? If it does, the building passes. If it doesn't, it fails. So that's in the most summarized version. That's kind of what the codes require you to do for a testing process. And it's often referred to as the grid based testing approach. Now, I'm going to go background just to here for a moment. And this is again was was kind of covered in different ways in the last two weeks. If you test a building and and it's in most cases true, you're going to need to put a system in to make the uh, coverage acceptable to a passing grade. There's going to be this project. And during the course of that project, there will actually be multiple types of testing that you will need to do. So you could start with a grid test and say, does it pass? If it does, you go straight to go, collect your $200, and you're done. If it needs a system, you might actually start to do something other than a grid test. There's this approach called walk test where you make continuous measurements along a path. And that actually provides a richer set of data for planning purposes. So that kind of data is collected by a test tool passed over to the designer. And they're going to go through the processes that Don talked about last week, where you're going to design the in-building system. What antennas? How many? Where are you going to place them? What kind of a BDA? Um, all those types of things are going to utilize that type of test data uh, actually better than just a grid-based test data. There's another type of testing you may do. So let's say you've designed it, you've built it, and before you do a complete grid test at the end, you may just want to check that the build was done right. Did it get assembled, installed, configured correctly? And so sometimes there's something they call an antenna verification test, or they might call the commissioning process. And it's a lot more economical to find the problems that way, fix them, before you spend the time doing a complete uh, grid test at the end, which of course you're gonna have to do once you're done and to verify that now the building works up to the code standards and provide documentation to the building owners and to the AHJ, you know, the authorities are gonna review the test uh, report. Now, in addition to all that, oftentimes there's problems to solve there may be a noise source, there may be uh, a channel that didn't get done well. And so a spectrum analyzer is valuable to have. So all these types of testing, it's extremely valuable to have them all integrated into one solution. Uh, that's one of the things PCTEL is focused on is be sure you can have one tool to use for all those types of testing. Um, just before we start getting into the details of grid-based testing, let me just make a bit of a comparison to those two types of testing we talked about. Um, clearly, if you're going to design, if you're looking at you know, how the signal propagates, if you're trying to make sure to solve every problem with the design, the walk test is superior. It has lots of detailed data, but it's also harder to consume. It takes a a, a greater degree of engineering expertise to be able to look at that, understand what it means, and apply it. The advantages of a grid-based test as it's been implemented in the two national codes is the fact that it is, you know, first and foremost, it is a much easier to understand test approach and test documentation. It's much more consumable, understandable by by all the people who get involved, you think of, again, fire marshals, uh, the people who will review the test report and say, yes, you get your building occupancy permit or you or you do not. You need to work on it some more. Um, you look at the one on the left and it's, is that really good enough? <laughs> it's hard to tell. The one on the right, 19 squares out of 20 are green. Good. You pass. You know, so long as the test was done well. It was designed well, the measurements are done accurately, and they were boiled up into a simple presentation. It is a much better approach to, uh, to all the types of people that get involved with approving a building uh, permit for based on radio coverage. Um, the other thing is it has built-in pass-fail criteria. Now, 
it's important that those criteria are generous, that they have some buffer in them, so that when you say it passes, even if it was slightly close to the edge, that would not be good. So you want to make sure you have a good grading criteria. But clearly, um, it's much easier for non-technical uh, people to plan, to execute, and to review and approve. So that's kind of the basics about why a grid test is done the way it is and what its value is. Okay, so from here, um, we're going to spend the rest of our time, the next um, 20, 30 minutes or so, and talk about the details of what uh, code requires for a grid-based test approach. Um, what's on the left is kind of a summary. So again, go back and think about it. So you have NFPA updated every three years. You have IFC updated every three years. Um, so we've kind of looked at those and they change over time and sometimes they'll change back. We'll talk about some of that. Um, and then each local jurisdiction may take one of those. They may take the 2012, the 2015. They may change versions over time. They may actually adapt some of it. They may say, I like the IFC, but this one thing from the NFPA, I'm going to bring over, or I'm going to kind of change it based on what I think is better. So one of the biggest challenges for people who work in the arena of testing and designing a system to meet a local code and then verifying it at the end is it's really very important to get to know the local mm -hmm. jurisdiction uh, that you're working in to be involved with the fire marshals and the radio shops to the much as you can and you get the copies of their codes and you understand them because uh, as you go through these next set of slides and we talk about some of the details it's it's important that your tool can really do whatever the hjs want but it's also important to know how to configure it to do that and to make sure that what you've produced at the end is a test report that reflects what they had particularly have required. Um, we right now got our tool being used in well over 200 jurisdictions in the U.S., counties and cities. Um, and it's, you know, it's three years worth of constantly adding new capabilities and features to adapt and adopt of all the ones we've met and worked in. Okay, so uh, first point here is, of course, that there, you have to know what frequency you're testing. Now, there is in the IFC, and you see it there on the left, the codes require that the local jurisdiction be able to provide the tester, the planner, the designer, the information they need. That includes, here's what our networks are, here's what frequencies we use. Um, they're supposed to be able to tell you where the radio sites are, so when you design your system and you put that donor antenna up, it's pointed right at the radio site you're supposed to be communicating with. Um, so really what that means is you're going to have to look at, you know, that information and create what's called a workspace or a project setup or whatever you want to do. What's important is there's often multiple networks. So you go to Las Vegas, there's a 850 for the fire and 750 for the police or vice versa. Um, you go to some cities and there'll be like an old analog system that they're still using for EMS and something else uh, for the fire and police. You'll be in, sometimes you'll be at a building that will be, you know, in the county, but it's in the city border. And at that jurisdiction to get a building occupancy permit, you got to support both because you don't know who's going to show up uh, in case there's an emergency. In each of those networks, there may be one net, uh, frequency they want you to test. So let's say it has a control channel. They may say, here's our control channel. Oftentimes, there's four control channels, which may be active on any given day. So do you figure out which one's active that day? Then you test one. If you don't know, you can test all four. Um, there are networks with no control channel. We'll have like multiple frequencies. So if you have a radio in your hand and you lock to a frequency, you can test that one traffic channel. If when you activate your radio, it's one of eight or one of 16, then you want to be measuring all 16 and use the one that activates for each individual test to be the one you're going to grade based on. 
um, if you don't have a radio, you want to test all the traffic channels. You don't want to wait till one turns on. So then you just wait till one of the eight or 16 happens to show up and you can use it for measuring. So again, you got to figure out which of these networks you're supposed to be testing. What frequencies are you including FirstNet? Um, maybe the building owner that you're working for, besides public safety, wants you to verify ATT, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint coverage. So again, whatever they want, you're going to add that to a list, create a workspace. And that's every time you run a test, that's the list of frequencies you're going to test for every location. Now, of course, to test the floors, you need floor plans. Um, there's This is actually a pretty important part here. Um, you want to make sure that the floor plans are legible. They have sufficient detail so you can tell where you are in the building, but they don't have too much detail that you get lost in the details. So, for instance, the one you see there, it's pretty dense with uh, detail, so it might not be the best, but at least you can tell where you are in the building as you're doing the test. Um, and the way I tell people is you better have good maps or floor plans and you better be able to read it, know where you are. Uh, I've seen more than once people out walking around doing testing and they think they're in one part of the building. And I'm like, dude, that's not where you're at. You, no, you're over here. Uh, so you got to be able to read the map and know where you are to, to do a good test. Um, now the codes say let's let's start with 20. Let's draw it up for 20 areas. A couple things about it. You want equally sized areas, right? So if you have a and, and ours has a little grid drawing tool and it enforces the fact that you have 20 equally sized areas. Um, and there's slots to be caveat. So let's say that your test fails. Uh, one or two, say two areas out of the 20, and you're not going to, that's not good enough to pass. They, some, the codes say you can now add 40 grid areas. One of the other ones says you can add 80 grid areas and retest. Um, but this is for a nice, simple uh, rectangular building. And so long as it's less than 100,000 square foot, or one of the other codes uses 128,000 square foot, you're fine. But you also want to be sure that you have a flexible way to draw these grid areas because there's architects in the world who love to be creative. I know I'm married to one. Um, so you might need to piece together the test areas with multiple grids. Uh, there may be odd shaped buildings. Your floor plan may not be perfectly rectangular or perpendicular. So again, we've created a very flexible grid drawing tool. I, in our experience, HJs are much less focused on exactly 20 areas as they are on, if you use multiple grids like this, they're e fairly equally sized, they cover the entire floor, and the area is not bigger than a certain maximum. So 5,000 square foot is used some places, 6,400 square foot is used in the other. But in other words, if you, if you got to where your grid area was 7,000 square foot, then you should really add more areas. Do you add another 20? Do you add five more? That's not really cl clearly stated in the codes. And so we find there's a lot more flexibility. Uh, but as an example, if you look on the left, those two grids have fairly equally sized areas and they overlap a little bit. So that's good. The one in the bottom, that center grid has way bigger area in each grid area than the other two. So that's a bad example of you know, it didn't really match what people are looking for. You want each test to be basically meaning the same thing uh, by having fairly equally sized areas, okay? So, but it, it's very important to have a, an ability to kind of create these grids for the variety of buildings that you'll run into. Okay, so next, the codes go into the, uh, make the point of you should make a single test in each of those areas. It pretty clear uh, that you pick the center to start with. And the theory here, as I interpret it, is kind of like a sampling, a random sampling theory. In other words, you can't just start in one of the areas and wander around until you find the best spot and use it. That's not fair. That's not really a, a good reflection of how well the signal's doing and whether it's going to be safe enough, right? So they kind of make you go to the center. Now, one of the codes says you're not allowed to move around. You stand there 
you're going to measure for a while to create an average that's considered reliable. It's trying to average out some of the things like multipath, uh, some slight variations. Okay. One of the other codes and is used in a number of jurisdictions is for each area you start in the middle and you may walk uh, an X to the four corners or they may say walk around a little bit. In any of the method, any of these methods, you're still measuring constantly on each of those required frequencies. You're creating an average value that you're going to use for the purpose of comparing to the pass fail threshold. Okay. And so, you know, the tool we've created accommodates all of those. You need to be able to uh, do the standalone method for one city, and then you go over the other uh, county and you do the X method. Um, so it's important to be able to support those various kinds and understand what a given jurisdiction is going to ask you to do. Um, besides doing a test in each of the areas, you may remember that uh, it was referred to in the last two sessions, there's a concept of what's called critical areas. And this is what's really one of the uh, most unique parts about uh, fire and police first responder uh, safety when it comes to communication. When you think of the AT&T and Verizons of the world, they when they provide coverage in a building, they're going to focus on where you live and where you work, you know, in your offices, in the boardrooms. When it comes to the fire and police, they're much more concerned about areas of entrance and exit, places that people might go to hide or escape, in an emergency situation. So they have this concept of critical points. It's fairly commonly agreed on what's on that list, although there'll be some small variations from place to place. Lobby, stairwells, elevators, pump rooms. Um, and so they actually want a separate test. So even if a stairwell is already in an area that was tested, they're still gonna want you to do a separate test uh, because it's a critical area. And when we start talking about the grading, they're going to grade it differently. Uh, so that's why another reason for the separate test. So you got to be able to mark what those critical areas or critical points are. Now, what are you measuring? Um, so historically, uh, since these codes have been around and they've been evolved through, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, the biggest focus was on measuring downlink power. Downlink being from the radio site down to the person holding the radio in their hand. That's downlink. So measuring the power, that's the biggest indicator of whether it's going to work or not. So the number of bars on your phone. But most people who understand radios realize that's not enough. Um, for, first of all, the codes talk about it because it's important. What is your uplink like from your handset all the way back to the outdoor network? That's important as well. You can also think about testing from the point of view of what is really being used, what service, in this case, voice. That is the main thing for emergency responders is you're not looking at, a, in most cases, a heads-up display with some data app. You're trying to talk to somebody as you're crawling around the floor or whatever. So a voice test has started to be referred to more and more in the various you know, iterations of the code. And they talk about doing a voice quality test and they're gonna grade it based on what's called a delivered audio quality scale, which we'll talk about a, a little bit more in a minute. Um, so, you know, the newest codes, 2018, actually don't even specify a specific power level as much as they say, you must have enough power to have a good voice test up and down. Now, interestingly or not, the, um, the, the next versions that are being planned of IFC are going to add back in a statement that say mm -hmm. you should have 95 dB of power on the downlink. Um, and, and again, so what about in practice today? So there's people that are on different years version of NFP IFC. Power is almost, almost always included in the test. The downlink power is almost always included. More and more people in our experience, well over half of the jurisdictions still make you pick up two radios, talk, assess the voice quality, and use that for grading as well. 
more and more uh, people are starting to use what are called RF signal qualities, and I'll explain those in more detail in a second. But signal-to-noise ratio, BERs, are a great indicator of what voice quality you could expect. So uh, some of the, actually, IFC 510-2018 already refers to SINAR as being a, a suitable way to judge quality. Um, in practice, most people, as I said, are doing power. Uh, a lot are doing voice test. Some jurisdictions actually make you put someone at the radio site or put a piece of equipment at the radio site to measure uplink power. Um, and so you'll see all of those uh, that may happen from time to time. So a little more detail, you on the left, you've probably seen this from the last two weeks. It's a definition of what is considered uh, voice quality. And there's different levels. Uh, three or 3.4 are usually the ones that are considered a passing grade, 3.4 or higher, 3.0 or higher. Um, but as was pointed out earlier, um, there's two things to this. One, it's a great test because it's what matters. Can you talk? Can you hear? Can you understand? Can you communicate? It's challenged because of its subjectivity. Um, it's, you know, how well are you grading it? How well do you understand the lingo? How well are you interpreting different accents that might be there? It's a very individually opinionated approach. It's also hard to repeat in mass. Um, we've got people who test casinos in Las Vegas with 30 floors above it. He did 900 voice checks on the fire system and 900 voice checks on the police system. So after 1,800 times of two guys talking to each other, is it even possible to pay attention and make sure you're grading the same thing at four o'clock in the afternoon as you were at nine in the morning? So the same document, TSB 88, part of TIA, that talks about um, the DAQ and defines it, also talks about these RF signal quality measurements, bit error rate, and signal to noise ratio and they kind of talk about here values that you can consider will give you a DAQ of 3.0 or a DAQ of 3.4. So that's one of the things we've added to our tool recently. You can now as you do a grid test you can be measuring both of those on a control channel or a traffic channel and you can now assess the likelihood that you'll have a good DAQ based on these values. Now is it accepted in the national codes yet? It's you know kind of referred to in one of the two. Will it be there in the future? I think it's going to go that way. Are more and more jurisdictions starting to use this either as a companion to the voice test or in place of it? Yes. Uh, the latest code in Denver kind of refers to BER. There's numerous places and and other cities and counties that are asking them to make these types of measurements in addition to the power measurements. So it's it's got a lot of benefits. It's uniform, objective, repeatable, accurate. Um, it, but it's also going to be important over time to find a way to measure these types of metrics, both up as well as down, if you want to come, you know, more and more replace the voice testing. Okay, so, you know, just a bit of background. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Basically, if you took the blue signal, that's what's transmitted by the radio site, and you took the red, and that's kind of a potential noise, and you mix them together. If you looked on a spectrum analyzer, it might be a little hard to tell uh, on some of these that if you just looked at power and you measured just power, that's not enough. You could have that middle or that right one, the power is a passing value, but if you're not either doing a voice test or a signal to noise BR test, you will not know that you would not have good communications. So voice test is important or and or assign our BER. Um, one of the other points about testing bit error rate that's important to understand is that um, classic bit error rate testing required you to do what's on the left. You had to take a channel out of service, send a test pattern over it. Um, it's a great bit error rate test. It's again got drawbacks because who wants to take the channel out of service and who wants to spend the time to do that work and every time someone does a grid test you won't have to go do that again uh, so it's not real popular 
our tool has used what's called a frame bit error rate, which it calculates the bit error over using frame patterns that are always there. It's an in-service test. So whether you're talking about P25 phase one or two, uh, channel traffic channels or control channels, we can still provide you an accurate bit error rate estimate with only a few samples uh, to get statistically accurate to meet what would be expected to determine is this a good DAQ score or not. So very valuable kind of tool uh, for testing on the downlink. All right, so now you know what you're measuring, a power and or a voice DAQ and or sign our BER. It then, the codes then talk about in some form or some fashion, depending on what year and what city or county, what are considered pass fail values? So we saw DAQ 3.0, or some codes may use 3.4. Um, power levels of 95 dB are classic, but you may also think in terms of a critical point, you because it's critical, you may ask for a different power level like minus 90. Um, there are things that a tool like ours will measure, and there are other things that our tool may not measure like automatically measure the uplink power because we're not the radio site. But anything that you're doing other than what we measure, we do allow you to put those values right into the user interface as you're walking around. So if you test the downlink with our tool and someone says, here's the DAQ up and here's the DAQ down, you can record those values. We'll compare them to the thresholds and we'll use it to consider pass fail. If you're doing an uplink power test, whatever you're doing, so now, you know, let's say you're doing that. For us to consider a frequency passes at an area, you must have good measure down, uh, good recorded up link power, and good DAQ scores, or whatever you're including. So having a lot of uh, flexibility in setting these different thresholds, because each city and county may have differences, and being able to include or not include what is required. So one may include bit error rate, the other may want sign R or both, or they may want the measurements and they don't affect the grade. So all those kinds of things that you may need to configure in, you know, for a, a given jurisdiction, you can do in, in the tool that we make. And again, at the top level, how many of the areas have to pass before you consider the building passing? 95% is typical, but some people use more than that uh, or less than that. Critical points is at 95, 99, 100%. Uh, our tool's highly configurable, and that's critical. You may do a complete test with a certain set of criteria, and they may say, you know what? I just realized we've switched from 95% to 96%. You can come back to the tool, change the threshold. Everything's automatically regraded, automatically. And now you can produce a new report that says, you know, you passed at 95%, but at 96, you fail. Uh, so they can do a lot of comparisons to what works and what doesn't work. Uh, but you, it's really important to be able to configure these thresholds based on each city and county. All right, now, that's planning, that's, you know, office work. You can get all that prepared before you go on site. Going on site should be relatively straightforward. As I said, if you've got a good floor plan and you can read it, you know where you're at, you just walk up to each test area. You execute the test of that area. We take the measurements. We save them in the table. We compare them to the thresholds. We grade them. And we start to show you on the GUI, uh, this frequency is passing. This one's not. Or they're all passing. Um, so you get a real-time display of your progress through the course of the building. Um, now, at the end, you're done. You've tested the whole building. Uh, you've got to be able to document these results. Uh, almost everybody I've talked to who do this kind of work notes that preparing reports at the end can be as much or more time as you spent doing the test itself. So what we what we think is important and we've added to our tool is being able to automatically create 99% of the content that a, a building owner and the jurisdiction is going to want to see when it comes to results related to the grid test. Um, and you've got to be able to have this prepared. So again, go back to that casino I mentioned, a uh, million square foot, 30 floors. Generally speaking, it took them four to five days to prepare the report with uh, previous methods of testing and recording. 
and now with a 20 minute coffee break, they've got a 900 page report, which has all the details you're ever gonna want to be able to submit to the uh, jurisdiction. So what kind of things do you need to put in the report? You want a very nice, clear summary on the first page. Did this building pass or not? He passed because all the frequencies passed or he failed because one of the 10 uh, failed. Um, you want some flexibility creating these reports. You may want to report on just the fire system and not the uh, police, just the city system and not the county, or combine them all. But again, each frequency is going to pass or fail for the building independent of the others. And whatever's in your report, all of those have to pass before the building passes. Now, the jurisdictions want to know a lot of stuff. What, you know, what thresholds did you use? What rules did you use? What software version? What tool? Is it calibrated? When did it expire? Uh, or is it not expired? Uh, who did the work? What's their FCC license? Whatever it takes. Those kind of things we can help you put automatically in the report. Now, for each frequency and floor combination, it's important that you give them the details. So how did this frequency, uh, this channel do on this floor? How many did you test? How many passed or failed? They're going to want to see them floor plan. So they see the grids you used, how you tested, where you tested, um, which ones, which areas of the building passed or failed. So even for a passing one that has 19 out of 20 passing, it's still valuable to the building owner and to the AHJ to know which area the building didn't pass. If they're not requiring 100% of the areas, uh, you're going to want to know which one might you have a problem at. Then, of course, uh, for those who are helping validate the details, if there's any question, you're going to want tables and tables of all the measurements we made, uh, the tool that measured automatically, as well as any of the ones that were put in by the tester. So uplink DAQs, downlink DAQs. Uh, for the parts of the building you couldn't get into, and they're called not do not test areas. You want to know what those were. Uh, you want comments to liberally answer questions. So we think this part of the building failed because the antenna looks broken, or we didn't test this area because the door was locked, or it was outside the building perimeter. So all those kinds of information, the more you can put in here automatically, that's going to answer questions for the AHJ and the building owner, the better off you're going to be, fewer calls you'll get, the less you'll have to redo. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff that you want to see in a report uh, that you're going to prepare for the uh, for the HJ. Now, there's a lot of other considerations that are woven in and out of these different versions of codes that get adopted and what each HJ uh, uses. Everybody talks about doing new buildings. So if it's a brand new building, you're going to have to test it to get your code. So once you've adopted a code like this, it's always new buildings. Most of them refer to major renovations. So if you take an existing building, you do a lot to it, well, you got to do the test. What about existing buildings? So as more and more people have experienced problems, uh, what I hear referred to as unfortunate learning events, where there's an emergency and communication doesn't work well, jurisdictions start to adopt the more rigorous thing that says, in this time period, you better get every building done. So I'm, there's something like that in force in Las Vegas. Uh, Florida as a state has adopted that. A number of other places are, are doing something similar where, you know, we want to make go back and test all of our buildings uh, and you have a certain period of time to make them work. Uh, another big thing will be what about annual retesting? Uh, and if so, you know, if it's not annual, what period? And is it the same test or something different? Those are all things you, you have an opportunity to learn, but it's also another a way to provide another valuable service. If you're a, if you're the ones doing the testing or the integrating, it's, you know, the ability to go and help make sure things haven't changed, and they often do. Uh, physical changes may cause something to fail that passed before, or changes in the noise, RF noise environment, you know, we also be a contributor. Um, there's FCC compliance you must be aware of when you install and des design, install, and test these things. Okay, so let's talk about voice testing. Um, if you're doing, if a voice test is required, do you do it? Or might they say, we want a separate company who does the voice test? Whoever's doing it, do they buy radios? Can you borrow the radios? You can go to Harris County in Texas 
and they have bags of radios they loan you out. Other places say, you know, you're not doing it, the fire marshals are going to do it. And other places they say, you must buy it. Uh, what frequencies are you programming into those? So those are all big questions you want to make sure you understand. I the test was done in my local county. They didn't do the radio test because it didn't say it in the local code. And when he turned it in, he said, no, go back and do the radio test. Um, so as much of that as you can get to know before you do the test, the better off you are. What's the final documentation look like? Uh, the grid-based test report, as well as other things. Um, think about doing your test plan and showing it to this AHJ before you spend the time testing. If they don't like certain things, they want you to add certain uh, critical areas or change the threshold, you'll be better off knowing that ahead of time. Does the person doing the design, the installation, the commissioning, the testing, do they need certain licenses, certain certifications? No, they want you certified on the BDA vendor. Uh, we can do that for you. Um, are you just doing uh, the network for the fire department, which is all the codes often say you have to do, or are you including the police system or the EMS system? Or are you including FirstNet? These are all questions that you need to be thinking about when you're ready to do a project where you're going to test uh, beforehand or test at the end. Okay, now, it, now that's grid testing. In the, there's other testing areas that I'll just refer to real briefly here in a few minutes. So, for instance, um, you must make sure that there's a sufficient level of isolation. I'll show you what that kind of means in a minute. Um, you're making sure there's you're not adding any noise, uh, that your system is not oscillating, which would be really, really bad because you not just don't work well, but you affect all the other people around you. Um, they usually want a record of power in and out of the BDA. Uh, if you're not measuring uplink power, they want at least calculated. There's a sp and those are all kinds of things related to the equipment in the equipment room, right, where the radio equipment goes. There's other things like near-far test or a nice antenna verification test. Um, so just to kind of illustrate a couple of these real quick, let's talk about um, some of these BDA measurements. So as we said, there's a, there's a signal coming from the donor antenna into the BDA. Then it leaves the BDA and goes out to the service antennas. Comes back, you know, someone's using a radio, comes back to the service antennas into the BDA, and it's going back out to the donor antenna. They want those levels measured. When you talk about isolation, you look at the output of the BDA back to the donor, make sure it's not oscillating. When you talk about isolation, what they're really saying is, is the signal that leaves the service antenna, has it been weakened enough, attenuated enough before it hits the donor antenna that it's not going to feed back in and cross a loop? Same kind of thing. Is the stuff that's coming from the outside world sneaking in through the service antenna and then kind of being fed back through again? Both of those would, would, would say that's a problem. And isolation says there's enough loss between those that you're not going to cause a problem. Okay. Uh, we talked about the near far test or the two radio test. The way that's into the code in 2018 and 19. Um, now, not a lot of people were enforcing this yet. And there are some jurisdictions that want it done in a slightly different way. But basically, what this is saying, and this was referred to earlier, it, of what near far is, but you need to be able to test it. So you're going to take radios, one near, one far, and make sure that the far one works well when the near one is on. But there's also, these are relative RF uh, power levels. So there are other ways to measure this uh, using equipment as well. So these are other kinds of tests that you may need to use your test equipment for besides the basic grid tests that we've covered. Okay, so kind of a little bit in summary for these um, uh, things. The big thing is get to know your ASJ, get to develop relationships with them, the fire marshals, the radio sites, get to know their codes, uh, save yourself a lot of time and trouble if, if you really understand what you're doing before you do the test. Uh, do they have specific requirements? Are they enforcing everything that's in their code? Maybe not. Maybe they have the two way, uh, the near far test, but they don't enforce it. It'll save yourself the trouble. Uh, probably should still test it anyway to make sure you have a good density of antennas, 
but you don't necessarily have to do it in a way that's going to be reported to them. Uh, are there things that they require that aren't even in their code? That's also fairly common. Um, okay, so, uh, so that's grid testing and specific and some of the other kind of things that you'll do through the course of a project. Real quick, just a couple minutes on what we do. We've basically created a tool. We use our scanning receiver to make measurements. We use an application called Seahawk Touch to kind of gather the measurements, you know, an automatic grid drawing tool, a threshold tool, all those screens you saw came from our software. And we really, we put it together in a tool that allows you to do all these types of testing. So you gotta do grid tests? Yes. Do you wanna go do a walk test for planning? Yes. Uh, do you need to drive around the campus? So if you're doing 10 buildings on a, on a, on a university and they wanna know what it's like in the parking lots, so you can drive. Can you commission? Can you test the antennas? Do you have a spectrum analyzer? With our stuff, it's all in there, highly integrated uh, and really uh, focused on easy to use. The measurement device is um, probably, uh, we consider one of the best in the industry, uh, obviously. It's like eighth generation. We've been making these since the late 90s. This particular one is designed from the ground up to be very economic and ergonomically friendly. So it's light, about four pounds, two batteries. They're hot swappable, uh, no fan, so it's not noisy. It's got two RF ports. It's field upgradable. It's got a five-year warranty. You don't need to calibrate, but every two years. So lots of very important features that make a solution like this an economically uh, valuable test tool to do this type of work. All right, and we do put out different kits, and all of these are available through our friends at Alliance. Uh, Charlie will be glad to help you. You can do stuff that's just public safety or ones that start to include if you ever start to do cellular work, or first net only, or all the cellular, are you going to start testing Wi-Fi? Do you want to test those third networks, which are we said are the private radio networks for security, typically use DMR. All those things can be added onto the kit, and they can all be tested at one time. So uh, we really tried to address all the requirements in this world of making sure public safety networks uh, can be tested and verified that they work. So we really focused on flexible, powerful, easy to set up uh, based on the HJ for the grid test, uh, easy point and click, uh, less skill required, and of course automating the grid, uh, the reporting process. Um, one minute on a case study, and then I'll be done. This is our very first customer. They wanted to test two tunnels, one using their existing method, one using ours. Uh, I'll let you read the details when I send out the PDF. But uh, Day Wireless has become a very convinced user, um, and they basically look to save anywhere from 70 to 80% of the time and cost that they would normally have on a project just by using the tool that we've provided. Okay, so that's kind of a summary. And uh, I think our time's kind of up, and so I'll go back to Lisa for any questions. Okay, great, thanks, Dave. Um, I'm just going to change the slide. So, uh, oh. showing, uh, whoops, the wrong, wrong presentation. I'm gonna fix that. Here we go. Um, so I just wanted to highlight to everybody the three webinars that are listed there that are coming up. Um, if you haven't already registered, um, we're doing one tomorrow. And uh, we have uh, another one next week with uh, Nextivity. And then we're gonna rerun the whole series starting May 20th, this, this public safety series we've been doing. So if you wanna attend again, or you have colleagues who wanna attend, um, I'll be sure to share the invitation with everyone and, and you can you can share it with, with everyone. So um, I'm going to go to the questions. I have quite a few. Some of them overlap a little bit, so just uh, be patient with me. Um, the, the first question that I have here, some of them we, I am gonna address offline, but uh, this one I thought was a really good one. Um, in new construction, how do you plan for and budget for a radio system that may or may not be needed when the building is constructed. A signal test cannot be performed until the building is substantially complete 
is there a dollar per square foot that should be included a contractor allowance for performing the test? Yeah, so, so typically, so first thing is, one, you can go to a greenfield site and understand what the coverage is from the outside network already. So if you go there and it's not good coverage, then you know you're going to need a system. The second thing, you're going to need to understand your building materials. So, some types of modern building materials are much more likely to attenuate a signal and drive a need for a system. Uh, but the, what my understanding is the common approach is most buildings are going to need it. Go ahead and put it in when it's much, much less expensive to at least run the stuff, run the cable, the fiber, whatever you're going to use. And then as the building goes up, you could maybe do a few iterative tests. But again, until the glass is in and all the walls are up that may impede it, you're really not going to be sure. Uh, uh, and so, um, you know, Don, you may have a comment on this as not because in terms of budgeting, you know, what you do. I don't know. One of our presenters is using a lot of papers. Stop that, please. <laughs> I don't know who that yeah. is. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, so, um, it, you know, it, again, as, as um, Dave pointed out, I mean, it, it depends on the, the construction materials of the building. It depends on um, the, you know, how much interior clutter because how much interior clutter is going to indicate, you know, how many antennas you're going to need. There, there's a whole lot to it. I mean, generally, I think if it's a fairly simple um, open structure, not going to be a very complex design. Personally, if I was an integrator, I would figure probably a dollar a square foot. Um, and if it's a more complex design, maybe a, a couple dollars a square foot. What you don't want to do is set a precedent that when you come back with a real design and a real proposal and a real quote, it's significantly higher than what you estimated because then you got trouble. You know, better to estimate a little bit high perhaps and then tell the building owner, you know, this is probably worst case and we will do everything we can to keep the cost as minimal as possible. Okay, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I have to fix my screen. I'll do that after. <clears throat> um, we had a couple questions regarding uplink measurements. So I'm just gonna, um, um, can uplink DAQ really be measured? Unless you are at the radio site, how do you measure this? Using two radios, aren't you just measuring downlink twice based on point of view? Well, that's an interesting thing. So let's say, and I've seen this a lot, a guy's walking around doing a grid test with a radio in his hand, and the person he's talking to is sitting out in the street. And you could say, well, really what you're measuring is your uplink to the radio site, downlink to him. And then when he talks to you, it's his uplink and your downlink. So if there's a problem, you might not always know whether it's your down and up or his down and up. But if he doesn't move, through the course of the whole building, and most of the tests are good and a few are bad, it's probably you holding the radio in your hand. It's bad in certain parts of the building. But there are ASJs that insist that the second person holding the radio sits at the radio site. He's in the radio site. So there's certain jurisdictions, that's what they make you do. But this whole process would be, in our opinion, improved if you could automate the measurement of the uplink signal to noise and ber with a second piece of equipment at the radio site so not only does it take the subjectivity out of the daq but also it's there for everybody to use so whoever's doing a walk test in any building it, he's automatically going to have uplink measurements to use to grade on as well as the downlink so you know a couple of a couple of different aspects of that okay thank you yeah. um, yeah, Lisa, I'd like to just make a follow-on comment to, to what Dave said. Yeah, um, the, the right way to do it, in my estimation, is, um, as Dave mentioned, many cases HJ says, no, no, we will have somebody at the radio site at the tower um, because then you know for sure that it's uplink uh, only being measured from the radio inside the building back to the tower.
Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Um, okay. Next question. What is the boundary to cover the elevator shaft? It's a critical area, but once the door is closed, inside our SSI is below negative 110 dBm. Uh, some people actually require you to put antenna in the shaft. <laughs> uh, Don, you may be able to answer this better than me. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. So yeah. So um, yeah. As Dave mentioned, some some uh, jurisdictions want antennas inside the elevator shaft. Some say you can put an antenna at the top of the elevator shaft and have it flood all the way down. Some jurisdictions say we want an antenna inside the elevator car. Um, some jurisdictions say, no, you can't put any antennas in the elevator shaft. However, we do want them covered. So then what you end up having to do generally is put a um, high gain panel antenna, directional antenna uh, at each elevator, uh, on each floor at the elevator doors in the elevator lobby. That's strong, got a, a high enough signal that it can penetrate through the metal elevator doors and then get coverage inside the shaft. So again, it, it depends on what the jurisdiction allows or and or requires. Excellent, thank you. I um I have a comment from someone who's on the webinar, Bruce Cobb, who I believe might be an AHJ or yes. in some sort of capacity. Yeah, he's with our uh, channel. Okay. Yeah, um, he says comment. We require that the near far test be conducted with one unit near the nearest antenna and the other will be far from the furthest DAS antenna as determined by the line losses between the antenna and the amplifier. This demonstrates the maximum differential between the near and far signals. Yeah, and I just follow up. First of all, Bruce knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Second of all, <laughs> not all the HJs are enforcing that, but but they should. and the way he described it was better than the way I described it. So listen to Bruce. <laughs> and okay. yeah, and Lisa, my follow on comment is that's exactly, exactly how it should be done. So yeah, that's, that's the right way to do it. We applaud that for sure. Yeah. Okay. So then another question, um, to collect data and do reporting, is it imperative to have GROL? Well, normally what, okay. So again, each HJ is going to have their own, and you could ask Bruce what they require. It's a, it, it's, it's, it's been this common denominator that it's the best thing for the longest time. That at least you have some certification, uh, and the the GROL is from the FCC. Um, typically, if you have one person on your team, you could have someone else execute the test, so long as the one with the license has supervised them and signs off and is responsible for the test result. Um, but as I said, it's up to in the jurisdiction where they require GROL or, and or do they require other things like you're, you must be BDA certified, the BDA vendor certified. Some people are starting to put our test equipment certification on their requirements. So it really got to ask the HJ. Well, Bruce just commented uh, <laughs> GROL and DAS certification. There you go. Thanks, Bruce. You got them both. <laughs> Listen Should to Bruce. <laughs> Okay, um, now, so I have a few questions. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna, just one more question. Uh, can we add a 20 dB attenuator to the donor antenna and BDA to, uh, I'm not sure what that word is, something the isolation between the yeah, donor. The isolation test I referred to. So I'm gonna let that Don go. Yeah, so now that means I won't have to answer this one in, in writing later, Lisa. So. Uh, no, actually, what you're trying to do is establish a minimum signal differentiate, differentiate, differential, thank you, between the donor antenna and the closest service antenna. So putting attenuation between the BDA and the donor antenna, yeah, that might solve the problem because it's going to reduce the uplink signal coming out of the donor antenna. But that means you're gonna have other difficulties in getting a signal from the donor antenna to the tower. So what you wanna do is you wanna put that attenuation uh, in the, uh, between the donor antenna and the first service antenna. 
that's the right way to do it. Right. Awesome. Okay, so now the last few questions that I do have are regarding the PC tele equipment specifically. So I, I'm grouping them together. So um, first question is, how is the PC tele device calibrated? Does it come with a calibration certificate and how much and how often does it need to be calibrated? It comes calibrated with a certificate. It needs to be about every two years. Uh, that's our that's our calibration period, two years. It needs to come back to our factory. There is a cost uh, we can provide you through Charlie. Okay, thank you. But, but All it's, right. it's, it's less than 10% of the cost of the kit kind of thing. It's, yeah. Okay. Is the solution designed to only work with PC tel antennas or can it be set up to work with any antenna system? Yes, so typically what an HJ is gonna want to see is you put on our receive measurement device, the antenna that's used by the radio that are carried by the fire and the police uh, policeman. So you can put any antenna you want on ours. If it's got certain levels of gain or loss, you can program that in and we'll adjust our measurements accordingly. So you get a real world measurement. Okay, is this solution tested, uh, sorry, is the solution integrated with IB Wave mobile planner? Absolutely, I wish I had time to mention that. But when we talk about getting floor plans in, the best way, if you're gonna use IB Wave to design with, put your floor plans in there, and then when you bring a floor plan, uh, you bring a IB Wave project into our, our tool, all the floor plans are there. We make the measurements. All those measurements go back to the IB Wave designer, automatically imported. Um, so you can do that several times during the project. At the end, you send the final design over. You can use our tool to verify whether the final build is, has any differences. Uh, easy to make notations on the design. Uh, document that IB Wave sent over and all the final measurements can go back for uh, you know the final set of um, reports you might produce for uh, uh, an HJ. Yes, tight integration. Great. Um, just two more questions right now. Um, do you offer any sort of credentials or certifications that we can require integrators to have prior to using your test equipment? Yeah, we do have a we have a lots of training, but we have one program it's a one day certification. We call it certified. You're certified that you can use our equipment to perform a grid test based on NFPA and IFC. We train you how to do that. We make you prove it and you get a certificate. Okay, last question. Can you say anything about inbuilding navigation capability of the PC tel solution where there is no GPS signal inside the building? So we have looked at integrating those solutions. I know that a few other people uh, use something. We we haven't found just the right solution just yet uh, that we feel is cost effective and efficient to use. So today you you must locate yourself. You must read the map and you know I'm here, run a test. I'm at the next spot, run a test. So that's the way we have to do it today in our tool. Yep. Awesome, thank you. Uh, sure. So Charlie, do you wanna say any closing remarks? No, I'd like to, thank you, Lisa, thank you. Day for another great session and more importantly thank you everybody who, who tuned in today as well as for the previous weeks we hope you found it useful um, we've got contact information for everybody don't feel hesitant to reach out we're all involved in this together we're all looking for ways to help and improve the uh, the communications for our first responders we've all got a personal stake in it so that's why we take it so seriously so we thank you for joining we certainly look forward to you participating in some of the upcoming events or webinars that Alliance is holding. And if you or a coworker or peer were unable to make these sessions or just want a refresher, we're going to be rerunning it live. So you'll be able to ask a fresh set of questions and we'll make up a fresh set of answers for you. And hopefully they're going to be the same. Good. So thank you all. Stay safe. And we look forward to talking with you in the next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.